Father, we pray that that will not just be a song, that each one here will have a heart ready for you to renew and to revive. No matter what we're going through, no matter what challenges we're facing, what fears we have, or struggles, we pray that you will breathe into us new life, healing, strength, and eyes wide open to see. Father, go to work in us, transform us, change us, as we strive to know you and to see what you have done and what you have been up to for thousands of years. And as we open up the pages of the Bible and as we look at pictures of Israel and Jerusalem, give us a heart for that. Give us a heart for what you have done there and what you still have to do and what our responsibility is as believers. So show us where we need to go from here. Season our words that they might touch us in a way that uh, gives strength. We praise you for all that you're doing and all that you've done in this time of worship. We pray that you don't stop there. We praise you for it all in Jesus' name. So uh, Terry's going to come up, and we're going to team teach together a little bit more. And uh, we've been talking about um, Israel and Jerusalem. And uh, so we're going to continue that. It's great to see so many people here tonight. Thankful that you're here. Uh, Terry, do you want this seat, or do you want to go over there so you're closer to the pictures? Right over there. Okay. And so, uh, so we're going to do a few different things tonight. We're going to look at some pictures to start with. Yes. And talk about what that means to us. And if you're here for the first time on Monday nights at night, uh, let me tell you, we don't always do this process this way. A lot of times, Monday nights are designed to uh, do what we talked about during the communion time. But also, it's usually time to ask questions. And uh, usually on a Monday night, we end up with some scientific question because if you don't know my background, I started as a science guy. So usually we start with some sort of science question, uh, creator, and those kinds of things, which is always exciting. And then uh, take theology questions, and we just do the best we can to field that, however it goes. And we're going to get back to that format soon. And uh, But every now and then you want to take a time out, do a little team teaching, and uh, you'll see more of that over time. But uh, Terry and I are going to team teach, although she's going to do a majority of this, and I'm just going to jump in here and there. Um, Terry just recently got back from a great trip to Israel, and part of this is sharing that story, um, but sharing it not just as a slideshow, not like the old missionary slideshows, you know, you just go through, and this is a picture of a bird flying over uh, water. And, you know, we don't want to do that. That wasn't funny to anyone else in here. But, you know. <laughs> um, it's the picture on the screen. That's what I was talking about right there. And so, um, but talk about the significance of it and why it's important, and then jump into Scripture and see where Jesus is coming from and where we get, where we go from here to connect there that connects to us and what our mission is and what the responsibility of this is. And so that's what we're doing, and uh, we'll, we'll do this a couple more times, and we'll jump back to some of that format. We'll do more Q&A, and we usually have a topic we talk about. Lots of good teaching on many nights, and I hope you keep coming back. Uh, I love this format and when we do it this way, and I think I love it so much because it just feels so much more like what that early church would have done, although if this were in our house, this would be a lot of people for our house, uh, but uh, you know, that early church coming together to study together, to pray together and do those things, it's so beautiful, so I hope you take advantage of this time to grow, to learn, to be challenged, uh, to be transformed, that's our thing, Romans 12, 2. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Metamorpheo is that transformed word. Change from the inside out. I hope that's what this is. Everything that we do when you come face to face with this, it has the potential to change you if you'll let it. And that if you'll let it part is important. Because God will not force it. But if you'll let it change you, come face to face with the Creator, come face to face with Jesus, 
which are the same, by the way, um, something changes in us. And so that's my hope for you as we do this, and uh, it's, uh, it's worth your time, which is worship. When you declare that God is worthy of even your time, music, amazing. That by itself is not just worship. This is worship as we declare that God is worthy, more worthy of whatever's going on on Facebook right now, or more worthy of whatever else you could be doing to just say, I'm fully present, and I want to grow and learn. That's what we do. So, Terry. First of all, I'd like to ask, how many of you guys were here last week, just by a show of hands? Wow, and we got you back. And I just want to apologize, because I was really ADD last week. Got really distracted by the pictures that are over my head. So uh, we decided to opt for a little different plan tonight. And also, let me say, Remix, man, y'all showed up. I see you in the house, for real. I love it when our teenagers come out and uh, seek God's face and seek to learn more. It's a pleasure to see you here. So the picture that you're looking at tonight, and I only have about um, five or six pictures that I'm going to share with you tonight. And then we're going to kind of um, just move out of that and strictly into the teaching points that we want to get to tonight. This first picture is actually um, a sunrise service um, where I was in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And so you're looking at a picture that I took on my cell phone as I sat for a sunrise service on the Sea of Galilee. And I've said it before, God does amazing things with the sky in the middle of a land that he calls his own. There's just something about the way the sun shines there um, that it amazes me. And Spencer often says that, um, you know, he gets surprised by God. At, how do you phrase it? No, not surprised. Not surprised. Always, always amazed. amazed. Yeah. So not surprised, but always amazed. And this is amazing to me. It's just an amazing mm -hmm. uh, place. It's an amazing picture of what God does. We talked a little bit um, a few times ago about the Sea of Galilee and about um, how challenging it is for some of us to just step out of the boat. To look at the water and put a foot over the edge and have the courage just to step out of the boat. And so, um, just briefly, I want to remind you guys and, and share with you, for those of you who don't know my story, um, about a little over two years ago, I lost my husband. Um, he had a hemorrhagic stroke and died in my arms um, in our bedroom. It, it took that life-changing event for me to have the courage to just step out of the boat. But it also took godly people coming along the way, and people like Spencer smacking me upside the head, um, just saying, you know, when are you going to step? God's got you. When are you going to step? He didn't bring you this far to let you fall. And so being able to be part of a sunrise service, where there was a disciple who used his mouth a lot, and sometimes for good and sometimes not so much, but had the courage to put a foot outside of the boat and step on the water. I don't look at it as a failure for him because he got distracted and he got scared, but having the courage to step out of the boat sometimes is huge. And so that's what this moment was uh, for me, a reminder of. It's also a reminder of all that is beautiful um, in the Galilee area. So tonight we're going to be looking at just a few things from the Galilee. This is a picture from Tiberias, which is a city that overlooks the Galilee. Um, so Galilee is surrounded by mountains, mountain ranges. Um, it is a lake, um, of course, in the center of those mountains. We are also going to spend some time tonight, and this will be the bulk of our teaching times. This is a picture um, overlooking the sea from the Mount of Beatitudes. And so we are going to spend quite a bit of time tonight on our teaching in the Beatitudes and about what Christ gave to us there in this land. Um, now, the, the particular um, site um, is as close as we know that it can be to actually where the, the actual sermon took place. Uh, remember, some things in Israel, they could say, yes, this was absolutely it, or this is where we believe it to be. And they're always validated by archaeological evidence, historical evidence, and biblical evidence. Okay? So, again, this is a different perspective um, from the Mount of Beatitudes. But you can see how it's a beautiful picture and how it's a natural amphitheater where Christ was in a boat on the sea and delivered the sermon to the people who were on the hillside. This is that place.
Um, this is a mountain that is at a fishing village um, not too far away called Kasaida. And the city that this mountain, um, that the mountain view is from, the city is in ruin along with another city that's close by called Capernaum. Capernaum is a city that um, many of you know of, but you may not know it by name. Capernaum also sits in ruins. The, uh, the big walled structure is the synagogue from Capernaum and around are housing structures. This is a city where five of the disciples lived, and it is a city that Jesus called his own city. It is where he did the bulk of his Galilean ministry. So, Spencer, can you read Matthew, um, let me double check that, Matthew 9, 1. <laughs> okay, Matthew 9, 1, getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. That's what he called this place. Now, in this place, Jesus performed quite a few of his miracles. Uh, this is a place where he asked Peter to go down and find the fish that had the coin in its mouth to pay their taxes. It is a place where he taught in the synagogue, and he taught um, with authority there. And in the synagogue, he healed a man, um, a, a man's hand that was deformed. This is the actual site of, uh, that sits on top of the synagogue that Christ taught in. And to be able to stand in the middle of the ruin of this place and know that your Savior taught there, there's nothing like it. I wish that I could do more to bring it for life, to life for you, but there's so many valuable lessons to be to be learned from Capernaum. It's a place where, um, in Peter's house, that's where Peter's house was located. His mother, uh, or mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law was healed by Jesus in this town. The ruins of Peter's house are still in this town, and over the top of it, there's an actual church where people still come today to worship. It is also the town where there was um, a demon-possessed man that Christ healed, a town where four um, men carried their lame friend on a mat, and Christ healed them. Okay? So this was a town that centered Christ's Galilean ministry. The thing I want you to understand about what you're looking at is the ruins of it. Because where much is given, much is expected. There are towns all around Capernaum that are much older than it is, that are still thriving towns today. But Christ did the bulk of his Galilean ministry in this town, and he told the people that he expected much from them. He also warned them um, that they were going to be condemned if they didn't live their lives according to what they knew about him. When you find out something about Christ, you're held accountable for that knowledge. Um, so, he, uh, this city sits in ruins because the town did not rise up to live with the authority of Christ. They did not rise up to, uh, to do what they were called to do. And to me, I want to apply that to my own life. What I learn every time that I step through the doors at Renew needs to be applied to my life. What I learn every time I open my Bible in my Bible study, because Spencer is a great preacher, right? Like we all go, Spencer's a great teacher, I enjoy being under his teaching, but Spencer would be the first one to tell you that your learning doesn't stop with his teaching. After we learn from him, we need to take those things home and apply them to our life so that we come out changed on the other side. And this was a city that had the opportunity to come out changed on the other side. But they did. And man, I don't want to sit in the rooms. That's what I think when I sit there. I know what you go. <laughs> so for me, it has a huge, huge impact. Um, so most of our uh, teaching tonight is going to be on the Beatitudes. So I'm just going to take you to that picture there and just kind of let you look at it. Um, and then we are going to start talking through. Mm. Beatitudes. Beatitudes. If you've got a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 5. Now, in the chair Bible, I don't have one with me. So maybe if you have a chair Bible, 
Uh, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, take one of those home. Uh, but maybe if someone finds Matthew 5 in your chair Bible, you can tell us what page it is. We do that, by the way. I'll explain something. We do that because we don't assume everybody knows how to find things in the Bible. And it's a good place to start. And if you don't know, don't be embarrassed. It's okay to listen to page numbers. It's also okay to look at the very first few pages, find the index, figure out what page it's on. There's nothing wrong with that. It's totally okay. Uh, and then as you read and as you study, that will become easier And as you put those things to memory. But it's okay, so don't be embarrassed. Anybody find Matthew 5 in the chair Bible? 969. 969? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so context. On Monday nights, we talk about this a lot. It's important that we get behind the text, we stand within the text, and out in front of the text. What that means again, and I'll talk about that stuff on Sunday. This is going way deeper, but getting behind the text is what's going on in the culture. That's one reason we look at pictures. It's getting behind the text. So when Jesus is preaching, we go, this is what these people would have looked at. I mean, this is what would have been going on. And so getting behind the text, what's going on in the culture, within the text are the words themselves, the grammar, the word choices, um, all that. And then out in front of the text is what does it mean? Why is this important? We're going to do all that briefly. But the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 are the beginning part of the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. If you flip back to the end of 4, though, it's interesting, just for context. I'm just going to take 2 or 3 minutes, uh, and then we're going to jump in here. But at the end of 4, verses 23, 24, and 25, if you're a note taker, circle 23, 24, and 25. Because what you see is, good thing my sunglasses are 12 though. <laughs> my iPad's not. <laughs> uh, 23, 24, and 25 is a summary statement of Jesus' teaching. That what you see in there is that he's teaching, preaching, and healing. This is a summary statement of what Jesus did. And this is the context of going into the Sermon on the Mount. That Jesus is out teaching, preaching, and healing. And, um, and we see that ministry is good this way because Jesus is a merciful, compassionate teacher and healer. And so that's what we see here. And so the Beatitudes then um, is a confusing word because we, it's one of those words we don't ever use anywhere else. Like you wouldn't say to someone, how are your Beatitudes going? We wouldn't have any idea what that is. When I've preached on this before, I usually call it the Be My Attitudes. Uh, and that makes a little more sense. But the idea of the Beatitudes, or especially as we go into the Sermon of the Mount first, now this is a good seminary thing. So again, if you're a note taker and you're a nerd, you can throw this out at your next um, Matthew party. But what you see in the Sermon of the Mount is Jesus is a better answer to Jamnia. Jamnia, which is J-A-M-N-I-A, Jamnia was the educational system at the time. This was like the university. And in this culture, it wasn't going to university to learn about, you know, agriculture. It was learning about who God was. And in this culture, they learned it from the moment they were, you know, itty-bitty. This was poured into them. And so by the time they grew up, they had books memorized, and this was a part of their everyday life. And part of what you see in the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus is better than Jamnia. That's the idea. Jesus is better than the educational system. Jesus is better, a better, um, basically a better rabbi, a better Moses, a better authority, and especially authority, because that's a big theme for Matthew, because his church is still very Jewish at this time. And so what Matthew's doing is he's pulling in these ideas and saying, look, yeah, Moses is good, but Jesus is better. Rabbis are good, but Jesus is better. Uh, all these things. This is the idea of authority. He's, you know, Jesus is a better fence builder. We've talked about that the Pharisees. They built a fence around the Torah to protect it. Jesus one-upped the one-uppers, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's what you see in this context of Sermon on the Mount. And so then when you get to the Beatitudes, which is where it begins, in essence, the Beatitudes are a description of the Christian community. That's what it is. The Beatitudes are a description of the Christian community. The Beatitudes are what a disciple really looks like. It's the essential ingredients, if you will, when you look at these, the, the essential ingredients of an apprentice. An apprentice and disciple are the same thing to me. But the attitudes are the essential ingredients of an apprentice. And that's what it is. And it's not just an attitude that you fake. What the real reality is, is that as we grow in Christ, and as we follow, and as we're changed and transformed, that what happens is we begin to overflow as God pours into us. 
We finished a big series at the beginning of this year on making space for God so that he can pour into us and change us. The Beatitudes are part of the overflow. It's part of what begins to change in our worldview and how we function and how we think. And so it's one of those issues of fruit. What's the fruit? What is the end result? If the tree is bad, the fruit's bad. If the tree is good, the fruit's good. And the Beatitudes are these essential ingredients of what it is uh, for an apprentice, what an apprentice looks like. And so that's what we get here. So these are spiritual conditions, not really attitudes. And I don't want you to get hung up on the attitude word. They're spiritual conditions, not really attitudes. That whole thing with the attitude, that was a man-made word they put in there to try and understand what these were, to segment it. It's a bad, I think it's a bad word, personally. I think these are the essential ingredients, but it is they are conditions, not attitudes. And so the last thing I'm going to say, uh, although I'll jump in here and there, is blessed, what you're going to hear, blessed are the, blessed are the poor, blessed are these, blessed are that, which really means in Greek, it's, I think it's still a poor translation, again, but it is what it is, but it is congratulations is really what it should be. Although it would kind of be weird when you read through it, but that's what it is. Christianity is countercultural. It is not the way of the world. That's, hard, that's part of the point. And so these are attitude. These are um, not just attitudes, but conditions of the heart. They are the essential ingredients. And it really says, congratulations. And so if you begin to read those, congratulations are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Congratulations. Good job is really what that's saying. Or how about this? Happy is the. So blessed are the poor. Happy are the poor in spirit. It helps understand what this means better. And as we go through it, we can kind of connect with the, what the language really was intended to say. It teaches us something different rather than blessed are the, I don't think we, that means as much to us. Congratulations or happy are those who, and that helps us understand. Okay, so the first one, happy are the poor in spirit. Yep. Four. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if you think of that like this, happy are those who are really hungry and need God. That's what we're looking for. As a person in the Christian faith, do I hunger and need God? Do I crave Him? Does my church body hunger and need God? That's how we inherit the kingdom. And, that's <coughs> uh, and I like the word humble there too. Yeah. It is, um, bless are the humble. So the next one are congratulations, those who mourn. Now, that's, that challenges us with the English language there. But congratulations, or blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Spencer often reads out of 2 Corinthians, and I'm pretty sure that's where it's turning no, to. No, I'm going to go to a different place. You no. do that one. I got a new place. So, um, one, of the things, one of the things that he used to ingrain in my brain when I was early on in my grief journey, because if you look at this, happy are those who mourn. Really? Because I was not. I mean, I just was not. And it's hard for us by human nature to be happy in the miracle of mourning. But mourning is just not, not just mourning of death. We all suffer loss. We all suffer hurt. We all suffer pain. What are you mourning? Are you mourning the loss of a dream? Are you mourning the loss of a job? Are you mourning the loss of a relationship? with a parent or with a child, do we understand what mourning really means? It means that we've lost or that we've hurt and then we know that, that we feel that. <coughs> and you cannot understand gain unless you understand loss. It's one of the big points that Philip Yancey makes in a book on um, not disappointment with God, but in Where's God When It Hurts. And Philip, if you're grieving, that's a good book. Philip Yancey, 1L, P I P H I L I P Yancey, Where's God When It Hurts? And what he goes through is he talks about leprosy. You now, leprosy is actually the inability to feel pain. So a leper could put their hand down on a hot plate and not know it. And so it destroys the tissue, it gets infected, and that's, that was really the problem. The end result of leprosy, and part of what he asks is, um, how is that for living? You never feel pain, but is this a good thing? No. Not being able to feel pain leads to death. Feeling pain is what helps us to live. 
and that we would never understand what pleasure is without the pain. And so the question is, would you give up one with, and uh, knowing that you'd have to give up the other? Yeah, I would tell you that out of my two-year journey through grief, I have learned that passion and pain are twins. You cannot have one without the other. And I would not give up 12 years of passion for the two years of pain. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, again, if you're a note-taker, it's a great companion passage of this. When Jesus said this, was not a new thing. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Blessed are those who are happy for this one. And I will tell you this, lastly, on that. You never truly know the joy of the Lord until you know the mourning. Strength comes from brokenness. Agreed. Blessed are the gentle, or happy, or congratulations are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. So a lot of us have heard the, the translation that says, blessed are the meek. Yeah. Okay? And we have this misunderstanding of what meek means and what the actual translation, and help me if I'm wrong, but I believe in Greek the actual translation for the word meek is the same thing that we would call domesticated. It's like breaking a stallion to make them become a tame horse. It is strength under control. That's what meekness is. Man, do I want to live that in my Christian life. Strength, but under control. Because I don't want to be the Christian that walks out the door as a pit bull for God that grabs hold and tears up everything in its sight. I want to be the pit bull that can grab hold and hold on, but gently take where I need to go with whatever that is I'm grabbing on to. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if that makes total sense, but it's you've got to have this strength that's under control. And it is a paradox. Yes. It is, again, it's, Christianity is countercultural. It's a paradox that the meek will inherit. Because we know in our general dealings with the world, it's the power brokers that get everything. But in God's economy, it is the meek who inherit the earth. And again, not a new thing. You go over to Psalm 37, verse 11. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Is that humility again, strength and weakness, strength and brokenness um, is important. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So it's a sense of which God wants us to hunger for Him. We are a society that is driven by food. I mean, let's face it. Most of us go to bed thinking about what we're going to have the next morning, Annika. <laughs> Just so you know, Annika eats a banana and oatmeal. <laughs> we had this conversation the other day. <laughs> so she's like, I go to bed thinking about breakfast. I'm like, really? What do you have? She's like, oatmeal. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. But it makes her excited. We think about the next meal as we're finishing up the one we're on a lot of times. But this is about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It's about going after God with that kind of, of angst and, and, and looking forward to knowing Him and, and gobbling up all that He has for us. Yeah, a right-mindedness. Um, that's good. Um, that's where we've talked about fasting with this idea too of denying yourself physical things so that you can seek the spiritual, uh, a way to make space. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Man, this is a hard one. Because um, mercy, it's not about being fair. It's not getting what is fair. And aren't we glad for that? Yeah? Because if we got what was fair, um, then it's what we think we deserve. And a lot of times we get really offended because we don't get what we think we deserve. Especially if you're meek. People <laughs> run over you. Exactly. It's just strength under weakness. It's not yeah. a run over. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's also not justice. 
Because if it was justice, if mercy were justice, then it would be um, what, what you deserve. So it's not what you deserve, and it's not what you think you deserve, but mercy is when you get what you don't deserve. And God often gives us way more than we ever deserve because he's our father and he loves us and we are his children. His mercy is giving us what we don't deserve. And, I, and I've said um, here several times, grace and mercy are two sides of the same coin. Grace is a gift that you did not deserve and mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. So you deserve a punch in the face, but if you don't get that punch in the face, that was mercy. Does that make sense? But it's also very similar to love. Love, an agape love, is not that we be squishy butterfly feelings. Agape love is, I'm going to do the best for you when you deserve it the least, or I'm going to do something for you even though you cannot return it for me, or won't, maybe not return it. Those three words, grace, mercy, and love, are uh, like the three-stranded cord. They are, in essence, the same thing. And, um, and I think it's so important that we understand what this is and blessed and merciful, which means, are you willing to give mercy because of what mercy God has given to you? And that's a challenge. Same thing with forgiveness. And God makes that clear. We're going to talk about that on Sunday morning coming up pretty soon. Um, God's serious about your uh, forgiveness of other people who have wronged you. And uh, to the point where he made some statements like, if you're unwilling to forgive, you're not getting it either. That's a really challenging, hard saying. And um, mercy and grace, practicing grace for people, um, practicing mercy, they don't deserve it, uh, in the little things and the big. And, um, and that's challenging. And it, really challenging. And forgiveness, just like mercy and grace, is not always an emotional feeling. It is a choice that you make. I choose not to kill you, even though I could and you deserve it. That kind of thing. That's that mercy. And you know what I'm talking about. And that kind of thing is, and the answer is, congratulations, those of you who can actually give mercy. You'll get mercy. Tough one. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. At the essence of our being, what is our heart? What are our motives? Are they pure? It's not about our do's and our don'ts. Did we check the good box to be the good Christian? At all. It's about what is at the heart of the matter for us. We can say things out loud, and sometimes we can say things out loud, um, but our intentions are exactly opposite of what comes out of our mouth. <laughs> so this is about what's at the heart. And the Pharisees, which one of the groups that Jesus was constantly, you know, at odds with, the intention of the Pharisees in the beginning was good. It was the idea of. You know, we don't want anyone to mess up uh, what God has told us. So we're going to, and the official term is we're going to build a wall around it. We're going to build a wall around Torah to make sure no one messes it up. The problem was the wall kept getting bigger and bigger and became a burden, and it became a task list to follow God as opposed to a heart. It became the checklist that says to follow God and to be righteous you must do these 87 things today and just check them off the box as opposed to a heart. And again, that ties in with this idea of it's not just an attitude, it's a condition of the heart. The attitude is part of what Jesus is talking about. But one of the things that Jesus rails on those Pharisees for, one of the things, is that they were whitewashed tombs. That, in that day and time, that was not a nice thing to call say to somebody. This was highly inflammatory. It was like put up your fist kind of thing. You're a whitewashed tomb, which means you look right on the outside, but on the inside you're full of dead men's bones. This was a tough saying. This is one of the reasons they wanted to kill Jesus, because it would be like me looking at you and going, you look right on the outside, but on the inside you're hellbound, buddy. 
worthless, useless, evil. That's pretty much what Jesus is saying. It looks right on the outside. Checkbox, good. But it's not because of your heart. Whitewashed tombs. And that's part of what this is talking about. Pure in heart. They'll survive. So then we have peacemakers. Shalom. Shalom. What's with peacemakers? For they shall be called the sons of God. So, peacemakers. This one's, um, to me, it seems to be one of the most risky. Because peacemakers often have to step in the middle of a war and be willing to step in the middle of the war to help bring about peace. It's also the place where we're not allowed to hold judging or judgment. Um, we're not allowed to hold pride. We have to be able to say, I forgive you, and I'm going to make peace with you, even if I never get the apology that I think you owe me. Being a peacemaker is risky. Who is the ultimate peacemaker? <coughs> this is the message of the covenants. The message of the cross is God being a peacemaker. He's willing to step out and go, look, I've made a way for us to find peace together. And it's us that um, steps away from it. Because it's difficult. It's risky. It's not easy. And usually it's not fun. Blessed well, are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Persecuted doesn't mean that as a Christian, you go out and stand in the middle of the town square and you thump your Bible, so to speak. And then people start talking bad about you or you clear out the crowd in the court square. And then you think, I did something great for Jesus because I was persecuted for his cause. Perhaps if you questioned yourself, it would have just been that you were obnoxious that day. <laughs> and you really didn't show the love of Christ. And who Christ is with, with hands and feet, but you were just obnoxious. So persecuted for the cause of Christ is different than that. Will it come a day when somebody asks you, do you love your Savior, while they have a gun up to your head, like happens to other like Christians in other countries? And will you at that time be able to say, yes, I love my Savior? Would I be able to do that? And not hear the cock for because I denied my Savior. You know? That, to me, is true persecution. Uh, the last beatitude is verse 11. And something changes here, and it's interesting. And this is, again, standing within the text. You see things change. And here's what changes. Jesus says, blessed are you. If you notice, all this other stuff is blessed are the, blessed are they. And then in verse 11, we get blessed are you. Changes to the second person, which really sets the stage for verse 13, which are disciples in the world. And so blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So, um, as we finish up on the Beatitudes and that teaching, I kind of wanted to bring this back to Israel um, and what our attitudes should be as Christians towards the nation of Israel. That's part of what our teaching has tried to be along the way, is to give you what this looks like in the land, what did Jesus give us there, but also this little piece of Israel. And so, um, I would say be understanding. Um, Israel is a modern democracy, and it's the only democracy in the middle of the Middle East. The only one. It is um, a place that grants citizenship and equal rights to everyone, no matter their race, religion, or creed. They are a true democracy in the middle of Arab nations. And so, be understanding. Also understand that there are truly nations that hate Israel just because they love God. They are the nation who gave us the Hebrew Bible, which is our Old Testament. They believe in that Old Testament. So be understanding. They, um, 
We should also have an attitude of being proud for their efforts um, to make peace and to stand with us. Israel stands as um, a partner with the U.S. in the war on terrorism. They embrace religious freedoms just as we do, and they're the only country in the Middle East that does that. Like every country on earth, they have a right to live in their homeland and be at peace there. That's what we all want, right? To be in our home and live at peace. In 2005, Israel gave up all of the Gaza Strip voluntarily, asking 9,000 of their own citizens to leave their homes and their schools and their synagogues and their fields in the name of peace. But we didn't hear that. Be understanding and be proud. Be motivated to understand why you as a Christian and why I as a Christian am grafted into Judaism, why it's part of our heritage and we can't be Christian without who they are and who they were in their faith. To help understand other people around us why it is biblically and democratically important that we support Israel. Be motivated for that. Be motivated to be a Christian who doesn't persecute a Jew. Because blessed are those who are persecuted. But remember how that changed. For my cause is what Christ said. Because of me. So be understanding and be proud and be motivated and be intrigued. Most of, of um, our modern inventions recently are directly tied back to Israel. Our security systems inside our airports and our cities that make it safer, our ability to communicate on cell phones faster and voicemail and instant messaging are all through Israeli technology and Israeli Nobel Prize winners. They work to improve medical treatments and medical facilities all over the world, and they share what they learn. So, those are the things that I would ask you to be about Israel. So next week, not next week, okay. Next week, after Resurrection Sunday, we are not going to have well service. We're going to take one Monday night off. Um, hopefully we won't lose our momentum and our growth, but we'll come back the next week and we'll do at least one more of these. And we've got to cover some other ground. We still need to come back and ask questions about salvation for uh, Jews and what that looks like and what that means uh, in understanding that Jesus is the only way. So what does that mean for um, the children of Israel? So we need to talk about that and we'll unpack that a little bit and some other topics. Yeah, we definitely are going to cover um, Megiddo, which um, most of you guys know as the Valley of Armageddon. Yeah. So it's good. So um, let me end with this. Where it leads to is you are the salt of the earth. If the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And as we go from this place, especially this week, where people are in tune in some way with resurrection. Now they'll call it Easter or whatever. As people are thinking about that, uh, millions of people will go to church this Sunday that never go to church other than on Christmas. CEOs. CEO. Christmas and Easter only. Okay. <laughs> and I've got to say to you, let this be a condition of your heart to have mercy on those who just don't know the truth. To be a peacemaker, to live out this life, to have these attitudes within you as a condition of your heart because you are the salt and the light that this broken world is yearning for, and they don't realize it. And so, I'm asking you to consider this week, through prayer and fasting, to ask God to show me who needs to be here with me on Sunday. There are a box right there by on a little guest welcome table. There are little cards in there. Take as many as you want. We have a bunch left over. Invite 10 friends, 20 friends, whatever it is. Just ask them to go. And if they don't live here in town, Encourage them to go somewhere. And then pray that the churches that these people go to will actually present the gospel message. And will actually teach them about Jesus. Not some good feely message. Not 
you know, the resurrection through an Easter egg or any of that stuff, we, to really understand the gravity of God taking on flesh and walking in the mire and the muck and dying for you so that you could be set free and be with Him forever and then live. This is an important message. Don't miss it. Salvation hangs in the balance of thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this town. So, that's my prayer for you as you go out. Take these, let these attitudes be in you. Let these be a condition of your heart. Because just as that commission from Jesus is, it starts here and it goes to the ends of the earth. It starts there and it comes here uh, to uh, these ends of the earth. It starts on Ritchie Road and goes to the ends of the county or whatever. Um, that's my prayer for us, that we'll take it seriously. Okay. We have three services. We have a Saturday night service. If you are going out of town to spend time with your family on Sunday, please be here um, with us on Saturday. Bring your friends for that service. And we have our two services on Sunday morning. They will all three essentially be the same service. Yeah. Um, we just need more room and more space. And so if you're not going to be in town on Sunday, please come join us on Saturday. And then the last thing is we're going to have a Seder Passover meal on Friday. I'm honestly not sure that we have any seats left. There we have, we, we're preparing for 100. On Facebook, you can hit it on my Facebook page. You can talk to Terry, put your name on the list. It's going to be first come, first serve. We only have 100 seats. And based on what I've seen, I think that's full. Cool. But it may not be. It wouldn't hurt to put your name in the bucket and to say, hey, I want to come here for that Friday night. I think it would be a good thing. Kirk may know. Kirk, do you know if we're at capacity for Passover meal? We're almost there. Okay, so there's a few seats left if you want to join us Friday night um, from 6.30 to 8. We will do a Seder service as well as a Passover um, celebration meal. Um, feel, feel free to be with us. That's it. I've got, uh, we've got a concert coming up on the 27th. Don't forget about that. And uh, talk to Dixie if you have questions about that. And there's a box by the door for our offerings and tithes if you have an opportunity to do that. And try and take some invitations with you. And invite some people. Other than that, I love you. Thank you for being here. Let me pray for you and then we'll be done tonight. Okay. God, thank you for tonight giving us a beautiful time to sing to um, have our hearts and minds directed to you through music. And as we've come together to do the things that um, you set in motion, your early church, to fellowship together, I pray that each one here will have a heart to fellowship, be willing to shake a hand of someone they don't know. The early church ate together. We've done that tonight. We've broken bread together. We've studied the apostles' doctrine. We've seen what Jesus had to say. And we pray, we humble ourselves before you, because you're the creator, you're the one who created it all, made us, gave us the ability to, uh, to see you. We praise you for that. Thankful for Terry and her heart for Israel, and pray that it's contagious, that we will not just see Christianity through the lens of Cabot, Arkansas, but that this picture is much bigger than us, and has been around for a long time. Help us to see ourselves as a part of this picture, not just a little microcosm of believers tucked away in a small town, but instead people who are a part of something enormous that you created from the beginning to change this world. Let us be world changers. Let us leave here and be salt and light to a dying, dark <coughs> world. Give us energy, desire and strength to do these things, to be ambassadors of yours, to proclaim the name of Jesus through our actions at the very least. Let's show the world who we are because of what you've done in us. Help us to leave your change tonight, never look back. I praise you for all that you've done and all that you're about to do still. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Yeah.